Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. As many of you are aware of, or actually are presently experiencing, we're getting a massive heat wave um, in many parts of the planet. Um, you know, we've had heat waves recently in India and Pakistan, which are extremely frightening because they're reaching extremely high wet bulb temperatures. I've talked often about wet bulb temperatures. Theoretically, at 35 degrees Celsius and 100% humidity, the body is not able to um, cool down because of sweating. You know, you sweat profusely in those conditions, but because the air is saturated with water vapor, the sweat on your skin cannot evaporate and cannot cool your body. So your body core temperature rises in that situation, you reach heat stroke, and then heat exhaustion, heat stroke, and then you die within about six to eight hours outside, sitting in the shade even. Okay, of course, if you're in the sun, that exacerbates it. Um, and that's a theoretical number. We thought there was a lot of validity to that number, but recent experiments show that that even healthy young people cannot withstand that 35. It's more like 31, maybe 32 degrees Celsius, where your body's not able to cool itself. So that's even worse. So the reason um, why I'm giving this video right now, I've talked about this extensively in the past, is that we're experiencing another massive heat wave over large parts of Europe. So Spain, Portugal, lots of, um, you know, even, even um, France, Germany, you know, the UK is, is they're, they're, they're experiencing, you know, incredibly warm temperatures, dry temperatures. And there's a red heat alert, for example, for um, lots of the UK in the next few days. And the Met Office is saying, you know, lots of people will die in the next few days from, from this excessive heat. So I want to talk about the root causes of this heat wave. You know, why is Europe being hit particularly hard? And a paper was recently published, a peer-reviewed paper, that talks about those exact reasons, or many of them, but I'm going to explain discuss this paper in detail, but also carry it a step further and because I try to figure out, you know, all of the different components of the climate system. So what's basically happening is, you know, we know that when there's, um, we know that the jet stream is getting a lot wavier and in the north-south direction and getting stuck in place. And under ridges of the jet stream, we're getting heat domes, heat waves, you know, lack of precipitation, very warm conditions. And in the troughs associated with these jet stream waves, we're getting uh, lots of rainfall leading to flooding events, etc. But what we're seeing um, in Europe is we're seeing um, a split jet stream condition that is being set up. And when that split jet stream condition is set up, the likelihood of Europe going into a heat wave is much, much greater. So back in 2003, we had one of the most uh, striking examples of this split jet stream resulting in that heat wave in 2003, which killed about 70,000 people in Europe, 50,000 alone in France. We're seeing this, you know, as, as um, climate change, climate system change proceeds, we're seeing high, more and more incidents of this split jet stream, some sort of wave guiding effects happening with the jet streams. They're getting stuck and Persi there's persistent, you know, heat waves extending for, you know, a week or longer, you know, over large parts of 
Europe. Um, and we're seeing, you know, more of these events, these events are occurring over the whole of Europe, but Western Europe is being particularly hit hard. And that's exactly what's happening at the moment. So the question arises, why are we getting more of these split jet streams? And there's a couple of, there's a number of different uh, possibilities. Um, and I think they're all contributing. The first is that the Arctic temperature amplification is enormous now. Um, for years, people have said, mainstream science has said the Arctic amplification is two to three times. So the Arctic warming is two to three times faster than the global average. But a recent paper I've been saying for years that it's more like four to five times, depending on how high up in the Arctic you are. And a recent peer-reviewed paper is just substantiating what I've been saying for many years, okay? They say that the Arctic amplification is more like a factor of four. Okay, so that's one factor. So what we're getting is that the warming in the Arctic over the land region, specifically in the summers, is getting extremely high we're losing snow cover in the Arctic earlier in the spring, and therefore the Arctic is much darker when you replace that snow um, albedo or reflectance with the dark earth. So that's a big factor. It's not just sea ice decline in the Arctic that's causing a lot of this temperature amp Arctic temperature amplification. It's the loss of snow cover. It's at least as large an effect as the loss of sea ice. So we're getting that factor occurring. Now, because we've still got ice covering the Arctic Ocean, the temperature is mostly pegged to about the freezing point. Okay, so because the, you know, any heat energy that comes in there doesn't heat the area over the Arctic Ocean, it melts the sea ice, but the temperature is maintained near the melting point of the sea ice. Okay, so the ocean itself is not heating significantly, you know, a lot like because that heat is going into latent heat, but the land areas around are significantly increasing. So that causes a very large temperature contrast between those two things. And what that ends up doing is you're getting heat domes over the land and, and you're getting the, the jet stream is then split. And once it's split, the splitting is reinforced because of that land ocean contrast in the Arctic. Also, another interesting factor is that we have a global warming hole south of Greenland. Okay, so there's a region south of Greenland over the ocean that we're, we're not getting lots of warming. It's actually been cooling in that particular region. So it's called a global warming hole. And this is because of the change of the AMOC. The AMOC is slowing down and it's not going across those regions where it was going before. So those regions are anomalous, anomalously cold. There's also lots of melt in the Arctic and that colder water is coming down south of Greenland. So those are the two factors, but it's the, it's the Gulf Stream uh, slowing down. I may have said jet stream, but the Gulf Stream slowing down, you know, the AMOC, um, slowing down that is causing, you know, this effect. So also at, in this region, we're getting a large contrast between the cold region and the warmer ocean around. And again, this is contributing to this um, meridional, you know, wavy jet stream pattern leading to the split jet stream. So, so those are the fundamental root causes. So unfortunately, um, Europe, you know, is in the, is in the crosshairs for these sort of phenomena. So, and, you know, this will continue eventually, you know, probably soon. Some people think this year, I, you know, who knows, uh, but the Arctic sea ice is on its way out. It's trending out, although there seems to be some negative, um, feedback processes that are keeping the ice there longer than we would expect. But when the Arctic sea ice is gone, then the Arctic Ocean itself can experience tremendous warming, much above and beyond where it's pegged near the freezing point. And when that starts to happen, 
then that may release some of the stress on Europe um, in terms of these summer heat waves because the jet stream may not have that split pattern that is becoming so persistent. So there's a lot of physics. Um, there's a lot of information in here and I'm going to try to break it down um, you know, based on what is it, what appears in this paper and then expand a little bit on that. So I apologize in advance um, for the complications in this video, but I need to uh, discuss these things to try to um, dissect it and break it down. And as I understand it more and more myself, then I become able to explain it in more detail. So this is the paper, I'll come back to these, but the paper is called Accelerated Western European Heat Wave Trends Linked to More Persistent Double Jets Over Eurasia. So if you want to know the root causes of, of, of the terrible European heat waves that we're having, including what's going to be happening next week over the UK and other parts of Europe, this is a paper to read and to try to understand and I'll do my best here to, to uh, you know, get you well started on understanding it. But first of all, let's talk about some, well, I should point you uh, to my website, Paul Beckwith. Uh, this is my YouTube channel and my website, uh, paulbeckwith.net. Please consider donating on to my PayPal account to support my research and videos or uh, subscribe to my um uh the the patreon my patreon account just search for paul beck within patreon i do have an a uh patreon um account and you could uh set up uh you know regular donations on that if you prefer that to to using uh the paypal um this is my youtube channel please make sure you subscribe to my youtube channel so let's go back to this so India, of course, and Pakistan have been having these massively deadly heat waves. And this article in the Washington Post about a week ago says that this will soon be a global reality. So this talks all about uh, wet bulb temperature. So there's an interesting anecdote at the beginning. So April, an April day in 1905, there was a scientist, Hal Dane. He descended hundreds of feet into a Cornish tin mine to find out if he could cook himself to death. There, you know, what a, what a, you know, to, to the advanced science. Amateur research, researchers had long known that humans have an extraordinary ability to withstand dry heat. One 18th century experimenter found he could tolerate temperatures up to 115 degrees Celsius, 240 Fahrenheit, hot enough to cook steaks. But the moist saturated air in this tin mine dug through deep hot rock deep below the water table seemed to change things. The temperature never climbed above 31.5 Celsius, but Haldane's body temperature and pulse rose with each minute, hitting feverish levels before he ascended after three hours. It becomes impractical for ordinary persons to stay for long periods when the humid temperature rises above 31, he wrote. Okay, so this finding hasn't significantly changed over the years, okay? But we do know after a few hours with human heat above 35, a measure known as a wet bulb temperature, even healthy people with unlimited shade and water will die of heat stroke. For those carrying out physical labor, the threshold is closer to the 31C or even lower. A recent paper actually um, using a controlled environment in a lab uh, setting with where the temperature and humidity of that room was controlled, it was found that the 31 degrees Celsius for healthy, young, healthy people is about the limit. Your, your core body temperature starts to rise at that 31, not at 35, okay? So that means it's even worse than we think. Now we're reaching this sort of situation in parts of the planet already. So, uh, you know, India's humidity rises before the heat recedes in the build up to the monsoon in early mid-June. So early on in the year, if India gets really warm, the humidity is generally not life-threatening, it's lower, 
But when the monsoon, when it starts to rain at the beginning of the monsoons and there's still the heat, this there's a big risk to human health in these conditions. So a place in India reached 37 degrees and 80% humidity last month. If both maximums occur at the same time, that's equivalent to a wet bulb of about 34. You know, that you can't work outside. You can't be outside. Um, some of the health centers in India, there's a special heat stroke room to quickly bring the patient's body temperature back down to a, a safe level. And there's always, there, there's, there's two or three cases every single day. Uh, you know, during heat waves, there's a lot more. So, Heat is very, can be very, very dangerous. You can reach a really critical stage where the body won't respond and the surface temperature won't reduce. And we're seeing the incidence of this more and more in people. India is not alone, okay? Uh, an unusually early and intense heat wave spread up from North Africa through Europe this summer, pushing temperatures in some parts of Spain and France more than 10 C higher than the seasonal average and breaking many monthly records. This this was already happening um, in the last few months. Now, there is a great danger, of course, that the, um, you know, Southern Europe is, will become completely desertified, you know, as the uh, desert conditions cross the Mediterranean and come up from Africa. So we're seeing this sort of happening already. You know, uh, and as the climate warms, each year gets us closer to the tipping point where large swaths of the planet are exposed to dangerous, humid heat temperatures. Okay, and remember that we're in an we're in a La Nina year. This is the third year that we're in the La Nina state, and there's less heat coming out of the ocean. So wait until we have a powerful El Nino, and the heat waves like we're seeing in Europe, etc., will get even more. Uh, exacerbated and will basically kill loads and loads of people. We're right at, right at that point. Um, scenarios where wet bulb heat waves could cause mass deaths was a subject for careful peer-reviewed long-range climate forecasts. Um, so there's more and more papers coming that on, on it, but also it's been in science fiction. The 2020 novel, The Ministry for the Future by Kim Stanley Robinson, the beginning of that book begins with such a disaster killing about 20 million people in India in a week due to the wet bulb temperatures being exceeded. Um, there is an apparent ceiling on humid heat because when levels get too high, they induce storms, which cools the atmosphere again. Um, 2003 incident in the Saudi Arabian oil port of Duran, the wet bulb tipped 35 Celsius, is listed in the Guinness Book of World Records. Wet bulb temperatures approaching the fatal 35 threshold almost never occur in the current climate, according to one 2018 paper, warning about the rising risks of this towards the end of the century. But this it's actually happening now. So three years ago, Colin Raymond, a doctoral student at Columbia, noticed a problem with these assumptions. Okay, so nobody had actually looked at the actual weather station data, terabytes. It was based on models of the climate. Okay, but he looked at the actual hardcore weather station data numbers and got alarming findings. Far from being a possible outcome of a future climate-wracked world, humid heat above 35 was already happening, from the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea to Pakistan, India, Australia, Venezuela, and uh, each coast of Mexico. Temperatures above Haldane's, the, the guy who went down in the tin mine in 1905, his 31 C threshold were turning up in dozens of places across tropical South and Southeast Asia, China, West Africa, Southern Europe, and the Americas, extending to the suburbs of New York and Naples, Italy. So people didn't believe his results, but there was multiple rounds of review. The study was published titled, The Emergence of Heat and Humidity, Too High, Too Severe for Human Tolerance. Okay, so low resolution computer models have trouble picking up this you know there's you have to look at the fine details the specific areas from the weather stations and it's in plain view so you know if we look back at india's heat waves they've been extreme the nation just experienced the hottest march and rec 
since record keeping started 122 years ago, New Delhi had, four, had a temperature of 42 Celsius or 107 Fahrenheit and above and above on at least 26 days this summer season, reaching 49 degrees Celsius in some parts of the capital. Okay, in the Himalayas, the snow melted early, the wheat crop was scorched, the monsoon rainfall was 32% less than normal last month. The heat wave was 30 times more likely to happen than it would have been in the absence of climate change, according to a climate attribution study in May. Okay, so India temperatures um, are getting dangerous. Even in 1905, Haldane wrote that there's a great lack of information about wet bulb temperatures. This situation persists to this day. That's a critical information gap because this measure is far more important to understanding the ability of our bodies to withstand heat waves. Okay, so, you know, as any athlete knows, sweating is what keeps our bodies cool. It's such an effective strategy that early humans may well have evolved to take advantage of it. The hairless ape with abundant sweat glands exposed to the open air could chase its prey over the African savanna to the point where its quarry collapsed from heat exhaustion, the human could keep going. But when the humidity and heat are too high, the air is too saturated for even our sweat to evaporate, so we can't cool down. We rapidly succumb to heat stroke and die after about six hours exposure. That could be in the shade and that can be drinking cold water. Okay, heat is a silent disaster. Well, it won't be silent for much longer because it's going to be killing more and more people. And, uh, you know, a major heat wave uh, followed by, uh, you know, an overloading of the electricity grid, uh, bringing down air conditioning with harvest failing, etc. These are nightmarish scenarios um, for humanity and they're, they're occurring now. And it's not just, it's not just in India and Pakistan. Um, and uh, yeah, so these scenarios, um, you know, a scenario that now seems alarmingly plausible would see months when daytime peak dry temperatures are above or close to 40, nighttime lows rarely dip below 30 for weeks at a time. So there's cumulative stress on the body and uh it you know it it we're pushing limits of survivability of humans in these conditions okay uh how many people might be killed by such incidents it's hard to be sure because of the poor quality of vital statistics on birth and death in india for example so you know covid deaths for example official figures show 481,000 covid deaths during 2020 and 2021 but a World Health Organization estimate last month based on excess deaths. So if you look at the more numbers and look at excess deaths during uh, the last few years, the World Health Organization thinks that more like 4.7 million people might have perished in India. Okay, so the numbers are not even correct. Um, it mentions here the world is going through its third consecutive year of La Nina which is this climate cycle that tends to bring cooler, wetter conditions to India. There hasn't been a strong El Nino since 2016, which is a relatively long stretch of time. But when it comes, it's likely to bring record wet bulb temperatures as well as drought. India and the countries that share its humid heat furnace won't be ready. Okay, so basically, you know, science fiction is no longer fiction. Those ideas of massive mortalities are very likely, you know, here and will get worse. Okay, so this is a key paper, a key article to read at the Washington Post. India's deadly heat wave will soon be a global reality. Now, I'm not going to talk too much more about the heat waves. I'm going to get to the paper, but, you know, this is the Guardian article, England braces for 40 C temperatures as export experts warn thousands could die. Okay, and you can just look at um, this, look at some of the level, the heat alerts for the UK. I'll just look at the map here. There's an amber warning here, um, Sunday, Monday and Tuesday, red warning Monday and Tuesday. Um, these areas will be have very, very, a lot of danger for people. You can't just treat this as, as, a, as, a, as summer temperatures. Okay, there's a 50% chance we could see temperatures topping 40 C and 80% chance that we'll see new maximum temperatures 
reached. So there's expected to be lots of breakdowns on the trains, cars overheating, relatives of care home residents have raised fears the heat could cause deaths with many elderly people already in distress, dripping with sweat. Okay, so, you know, this is this is a very uh, risky, dangerous system. Thousands of people could die just in England alone from these heat waves. European heat wave, France, Spain, Portugal battle wildfires, UK on extreme heat alert. Okay, so, you know, lots of wildfire threats, things drying out, already ongoing fires in, you know, many places, Portugal, Spain, drought, Germany bracing itself, sweltering heat, okay? Okay, so if you just look at Climate Reanalyzer and look at the uh, daily temperature, um, it doesn't look so bad yet here, you know, UK being here. Um, Earth Null School, of course, is another good place to look, and uh, I'm not going to dwell on this, but, you know, you basically get, uh, there's a bit of a ridge here, when you get a ridge, you get the heat waves underneath. It doesn't look too bad uh, at the moment, but next week it's going to worsen and you can track Earth Null School to look at that. Um, this is an article in the Berent, Berent uh, Observer. The Arctic warming is four times faster than thought. Okay, um, so people have been saying two to three times, but they look at a 30 year period you know, all these people did is they looked at over 21 years instead, and they found the Arctic amplification, you know, is more like four times in the last couple decades. And there was a distinct step upward in 1986, and there was a second one upward in the Arctic amplification in 1999. They looked at 39 climate models, only four, four of them did reproduce the 1986 step, none reproduced the 99 step. Okay, but uh, anyway, four times faster. So that Arctic amplification, like I said, is important for, um, here, here's the actual paper, annual mean Arctic amplification. And they looked at it from 1970 to 2020. And um, basically it varied between two and three during the 1970 to 2000 period, but it reached values exceeding four during the first two decades of the 21st century. So from 2000 uh, to 2020, the Arctic amplification has been four. So forget about that two to three or 2.5 number. You know, it was four. And if you go to higher latitudes, it's even higher. Okay, uh, and it talks about the step increase in 86 and also in 99 that is not being picked up for the model. So keep that in mind. And now I'm going to talk about this paper that just came out. Um, and it's called, this is the key paper for explaining, you know, why we're getting these massive heat waves in Western Europe. Why? Um, so I'll go into, the, into this paper in great detail. Okay, so accelerated Western European heat wave trends are linked to more persistent double jets over Eurasia. Okay, of course, persistent heat extremes can have severe impacts for ecosystems and societies, including excess mortality, wildfires, harvest failures. Europe is being identified as a heat wave hotspot, ex exhibiting upward trends that are three to four times faster compared to the rest of the northern mid latitudes over the first over the past 42 years. Okay, so that four times faster warming in the Arctic um, from Arctic amplification. We could call this European heat amplification, if you like. Turns out that Europe heat waves have been also have increased three to four times faster compared to the rest of the northern mid latitudes over the past four decades. This accelerated trend is linked to atmospheric dynamical changes, okay? So that's, we're talking jet stream. It's an increase in the frequency and persistence of double jet stream states over Eurasia. We find that double jet occurrences are particularly important for Western European heat waves. They explain up to about a third, 35% of temperature variability. The upward trend in the persistence of the double jet events explains almost all the accelerated heat wave trend in Western Europe 
and about 30% of it over the extended European region. So it completely explains the accelerated heat wave trend over Western Europe, which will be soon hitting the U. It's hitting uh, Spain and France now. It's going to be hitting the UK over the next few days. In addition to thermodynamic drivers, the atmospheric dynamical changes, that's the jet stream changes, have contributed to the increased rate of European heat waves with implications for risk management and potential adaptation strategies. Okay, so this is a very, it's well worth reading this, this entire thing. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to, um, yeah, I'm going to talk about it a lot, actually. Um, so heat extremes have increased on a global scale over recent decades. They're expected to further increase under future global warming. So Europe's seen a particularly strong increase in heat extremes since a deadly summer in 2003, which killed an estimated 70,000 people. This tendency is illustrated. There's been a recent cluster of consecutive, exceptionally hot and dry summers, 2018, 2019, 2020, and now 2022. European heat waves are projected to increase disproportionately compared to the global mean temperature. The underlying region, reasons are not well understood, but this paper and, and some of the things I've said are, are, are are, are finding are, are, are teasing out these reasons. So the drivers of the European summer hot temperatures and heat wave variability include large scale atmospheric circulation um, and jet stream states, soil moisture deficit. Once the heat wave gets going and there's less and less moisture in the soil, the heat can take off. So th those are land atmosphere feedbacks. Oceanic circulation patterns changing, that's the AMOX slowing down, that's the global warming hole south of Greenland, the cooler region, so sea surface temperatures. Um, anthropogenic global warming, mainly due to increasing greenhouse gases, increases the intensity and frequency of heat waves by direct warming, but, can, but also affects these drivers of natural variability. So observational and model-based studies have shown that summer heat extremes over the northern mid-latitudes are primarily associated with blocking anticyclones, so highs or heat domes, if you like. These blocking high-pressure systems are often linked to a double jet stream structure over Eurasia that favors the formation in the region of weak winds between the two maxima in the zonal winds. Zonal winds are the west to east winds. Rosby wave breaking and blocking may also split the jet stream and cause these double jets. Either way, the, the existence of the double jet in the troposphere is characterized by a very confined subtropical, subtropical jet that can affect Rosby waves in the mid-latitudes favoring the stagnation or persistence <coughs> of ridges and troughs. Accelerated high-latitude land warming during the boreal summer which has been attributed to anthropogenic climate change, could favor fav could provide favorable conditions for the occurrence or the persistence of the double jet straits by a strengthening of the polar jet front. So we're losing the snow cover in the Arctic over the land in the spring. The land is warming greatly. Like I said, the, the ocean uh, covered with sea ice is not changing uh, in temperature. It's pegged close to the freezing point, the melting point of the sea ice. So that um, contrast is causing these regimes where we're getting this double jet flow because the zonal flow is weakening under pronounced Arctic amplification. Okay, so this is happening. Um, so this paper studies all of these things and you know, it looks at the results and uh, I'm just going to show the, the figures basically. Okay, so here we have a global map here. And this is the heat wave frequency trend in days per decade. So the red areas are the bad areas where we're getting more heat waves um, occurring. You know, here we go over, over the uh, southwest U.S., and you know, lots of Asia and Europe here. And if you look at the mid latitudes in general, and you look at Europe, this is heat wave frequency trend days per decade. And you see that the changes in Europe are three times higher than the changes overall in the mid latitudes. A lot more heat waves 
the, the frequency of heat waves is severely increased over Europe. Okay, um, this is the heat wave. This is the cumulative intensity trend, degrees Celsius per decade. And again, you see Europe is a very red area. It's having some of the biggest changes in heat wave cumulative intensities. And if you look at the mid latitudes and Europe, the, the changes in Europe, the heat wave cumulative intensity trend in Europe is 1.69 degrees Celsius compared to 0.44 degrees Celsius per decade in mid latitudes. It's four times higher and look how big it is. You know, so in the last decade, Europe is being smashed by heat waves. What's going to happen in the next decade? Okay, so this is a key, a key uh, finding um, from this paper. Um, this is the uh, image that I showed you at the, that was uh, on the screen at the very beginning of this video. So this is the occurrence of the single jet. It's, we've got latitude and the pressure level, the height. So this is about the height of the jet streams, the 200 hexapascal or 200 millibar. And you can see we've got a single jet here. That's happening about a third of the time. The double jet we're having happening about a third of the time too. So there's a jet here and there's another jet here. Okay, and uh, so one jet set, uh, you know, it's about the 40 degrees latitude, 40, 45. And there's a second one at about 70 to 75. Okay, you get this double jet pattern. Um, the mixed jet where you get uh, something in the middle of these two is happening the rest of the time. Um, this is the uh, trend line here. Um, we're getting uh, more of these double jets over time occurring. Um, this is, uh, okay, this, the frequency is the gray. So plus 2.9 days per decade for the double jet. And we're getting less of the single jet and less of the mixed right? Negative 2.3, negative 0.6, plus 2.9 days per decade for the double jet. We're getting more and more double jets. This is the persistence of how long it's lasting. So the double jet state is, is increasing. It's, one, it's increased by about 1.7 days per decade. So it's lasting longer. That's the persistence of the jet, whereas the other two are when they do happen, they're happening for shorter periods of time. So the double jet is happening more often and its, and its persistence is longer. Now here is the, here is the uh, this is uh, the wind in the, uh, from west to east, the zonal winds, U250, 250 millibar, the anomalies in meters per second. Um, and what you can see is the single jet, this is the sort of state here where the winds are the highest in this region. This is the double jet case here, and this is a sort of a mixed case. And the temperature anomalies that result are, you know, colder across Europe here. But the, this is with the double jet, you get these warm areas in Europe, but also, you know, warm areas up in uh, far eastern Asia. Um, and this is the cumulative intensity. Look how high the cumulative intens intensity uh, is over Europe with this uh, double jet. So the double jet is causing the problem. Okay, so then the question is, well, why is the double jet occurring? Uh, this is uh, V, so this is um, north-south winds, the anomaly. And you can see what's happening is, you know, we're getting, we're getting uh, with the double jet, we're getting a lot more meridional flow over the European region, it's sort of sticking and causing these problems, okay? So uh, there's some analysis here showing that these double jets are becoming quite persistent when they do occur. So the double jets, they explain up to about a third of the heat wave variability over parts of Western Europe, and their upward trend has contributed significantly to the observed amplified European heat wave trend. Okay, so this is very, very significant. Um, here's some more, uh, more plots. Uh, these, this is some actual data. Uh, this is uh, July, August, 1994, sort of heat wave here. July, August, 2003, this was the Europe, big European heat wave that killed 70,000 people. 
And uh, here's some other cases here where you have the, uh, the so you have like uh, the, the split jet here and here, here and here, here and here, and here and here. You get, these are all the cases, these are all examples of where you get that uh, split jet to cause a heat wave over Europe. Um, discussion, very important discussion. So, I mean, I'll talk about it. A possible driver of more persistent double jet events is the increased thermal contrast across the Arctic coastline due to the enhanced high latitude land warming compared to essentially no warming over the cooler Arctic Ocean. Okay, the Arctic Ocean is still ice covered. So the heat over the Arctic Ocean is going to melt the ice, but the temperature is still pegged at about the melting point. So it's not changing temperature over the ocean, but the land, you know, especially when we lose more and more snow cover early in the spring, the land is warming much, much faster. So that leads to a strong temperature contrast, which tends to make the jet stream much more meridional and cause this double jet sort of system, which then locks in a persistent heat wave. Okay, so the land area surrounding the Arctic Ocean has seen very rapid warming in summer, likely also linked to stark reductions in early summer snow cover. This implies that while the overall equator to pole temperature gradient is reducing due to Arctic amplification, right? The, the uh, Arctic is warming much, much faster than the lower latitudes. So the, te the gradient is reducing, so the jet stream slows down and gets wavier, right? You've heard me say that ad nauseum, like a broken record. Um, but the thermal gradient between the land ocean increases north of the Arctic Circle. That strengthens the Arctic front jet at about 70 to 80 north. So we get that jet at 70 to 80 north. We also get the one at 40 degrees north. That split jet is acting like a waveguide which is uh, trapping, you know, which is, which is uh, causing these sort of heat wave effects in, in Europe. So uh, what else is going on? Um, you know, there's been papers on quasi-resonant amplification of the jet stream. This leads to high amplitude cir circumglobal waves. It's associated with double jet flow regimes. The double jet configuration can provide the necessary latitudinal waveguide by a confined subtropical jet which traps and amplifies the Rosby waves. Such states have been identified for extreme summer months. Double jets are associated with a strong and confined subtropical jet favoring waveguide ability and amplified circumglobal wave patterns in the meridional wind. Okay, so we get the, these are very important for heat extremes in Western Europe. Likewise, such confinement is also possible for the polar jet in boreal summer. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, our work adds to the body of evidence that double jets and blocking are strongly related. On the one hand, one can argue that a double jet configuration leads to the formation of a blocking anticyclone in the region of weak winds between the two zonal wind maxima. Okay, um, the double jet stream tends to cause atmospheric blocking. Additionally, a double jet could favor the maintenance of a high latitude blocking anticyclone by advecting low potential vorticity air into the system. Um, double jets may thus be a cause for or a consequence of blocking. So there's a lot of work in, in, to go in the understanding of this. Okay. Um, one, our preferred interpretation is that double jets and blockings are two aspects of the same dynamical flow pattern that can be triggered by different processes, including internal atmospheric dynamics like resonance effects or wave guiding effects, ocean atmosphere interactions, um, you know, especially in the Arctic with the warm land cold ocean, tropical Rosby waveguide forcing. Okay, um, and there's also the, um, you know, th there's lots of other possibilities. They mention also the AMOC slowing. Finally, several studies have discussed the potential role of an AMOC slowdown. That's the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation Slowdown, that an associated North Atlantic Warming Hole. So that's the, 
the cool area south of Greenland, and that has uh, that could have a role in Western European summer climate mediated by an ocean-induced atmospheric response. Okay, so this is another factor. Um, the AMOC slowdown has been um, associated with more frequent high pressures over Western Europe. So, so can contribute. You know, it's been associated with the heat dome over Western Europe. Okay, so that's another factor. Um, so this is not really being picked up in most of the models, right? So, you know, we need to understand this because people in Europe are dealing with it every summer now. Um, and there's been papers showing, of course, that certain jet stream configurations are also linked to concurrent extremes in different mid-latitude regions because these waves go all the way around the planet. So that can pose simultaneous risks to multiple bread baskets, endangering global food security and social stability. Okay, so I think that we have this sort of thing to look forward to, you know, in the next five to 10 years. Uh, huge stresses on our ability to produce food, causing food spikes uh, and uh, possible uh, global famine, multiple uh, cat cat catastrophes from that. So. This is a key paper, highly recommend that you have a look at it. Some of the other things that I'm looking at, and I will, I will do a lot of videos on the jet streams because the jet streams are, they're really the key to everything. But here's some other topics. A major solar storm can strike Earth. We need to be ready. You know, the Rogers uh, internet went out in Canada for a day. Actually, for some people, it was multiple days. You know, a solar storm would wipe that out and destroy equipment. So. You know, it was actually mentioned here, you know, big, big article in, in, in uh, the Globe and Mail, Canada's national newspaper. Uh, here, here, Harvard has a nice paper on coronavirus and climate change and the environment, you know, connecting those. Uh, there's a new method of determining how society thinks about risk, right? It's probably worth looking at this paper. This is just a smorgasbord. Uh, this article is interesting, reviewing the impacts of climate change on air transport operations. So changing the jet streams, affecting uh, air, airplane travel along the Great Circle routes, uh, clear air turbulence and stuff. Uh, explaining the jet stream to the people. There's a whole paper here on climate literacy and, you know, problems for explaining something like the jet stream to the general public. Um, Large, you know, this is a thesis. There's a very interesting thesis that was just published in 2022. It's called the Large Scale Atmospheric Circulation Response to Climate Change Drivers, a multi-model comparison study. So it's all about jet stream changes, um, how climate drivers are changing the jet stream. I haven't read the whole thing, but I want to point it out. Um, and there's a couple of interesting papers where people are doing lab experiments. So they set up uh, fluids in a rotating cylinder uh, to try to study the, the jet stream. So you have uh, the cylinder, there's fluid in here, there's a, there, there's a section, there's an outer cylinder, there's an inner cylinder. This thing spins around, it creates the fluid motions and you examine the physics of the fluid motion. And there's a lot of similarities. You can learn a lot about the jet stream from doing these physical experiments. And there's another one uh, here, a laboratory model for a meandering zonal jet, same sort of thing, you know, where you, you set up in the lab, uh, you know, rotating um, cylinders and have the fluids and, and you look at, uh, here's a, there's a drain here, different ways of looking at it, slope bottoms, and you can try to figure out, uh, you know, you can model the dynamics of the jet stream in the lab. And I'm finding loads of other papers. If I just, I'm in Google Scholar, I'm looking at jet streams, climate change since 2022, you know, coming up with all of these different papers. So, you know, what I can learn from these papers, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, put in videos and get back to you. Um, so, but anyway, this is the paper. This is the key paper here. And the key, some of the key summaries are, you know, we're getting more and more heat waves in Europe. They're happening more and more often three times more often than in the mid-latitudes in general, four times more often cumulatively, 
1.69 degrees Celsius increase of temperature for decade in parts of Europe. And the reason is that the double jet, which is happening about a third of the time, is confining uh, the uh, and affecting the Rosby waves, the jet stream in this region. It's becoming much more meridional and stuck, and we're getting these uh, massive heat waves uh, you know, affecting many, many people in Europe as a result of this effect. This is temperature anomalies and this is the cumulative intensity. And, uh, you know, we've, we've seen these heat waves are getting more severe and affecting a lot more people. Um, so those are the key, the key factors. So I hope, uh, there's a lot of technical stuff in this video, but I hope, uh, you know, as I understand it, as I read more and more of it and understand more and more of it myself, I will try to communicate what I what I uh, learn to you. But this is this is very, very crucial, cutting edge climate science, which uh, is trying to explain what's happening in to 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 uh, cause these 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 European heat waves, which, you know, and it looks like um, that it's tied in intricately to the Arctic sea ice loss, the snow cover over Arctic lands loss in the spring, the Arctic temperature amplification, and um, even the slowing of the AMOC and the global warming hole south of Greenland. All of these things are look like to be important factors in causing these split or double jets over Eurasia, which are then directly causing these heat waves. So thanks again for listening. And just a reminder, go to my blog, paulbeckwith.net, and please consider donating to PayPal to support my research and videos. Okay, stay cool. Um, thanks and, uh, and uh, bye for now.